Uh, Christoph Jeffrey Lott is a CNRS Senior Research Fellow, Visiting Professor at the King's India Institute London and a Global Scholar at Princeton University. Uh, as we all know and we have read him in different newspapers and magazines, he is an expert on South Asian politics. Professor Christoph has served as Director of CERI in, from 2008 to, sorry, from 2000 to 2008. He is a senior editor of a Sciences Po book series, Comparative Politics and International Studies, published by Hearst London and Oxford University Press, New York. And one, the many topics he writes, some amongst them include nations and nationalism and international uh, political sociology. Which we indeed need to commemorate. And listening to you, I went on the memory lane, remembering the 10th anniversary, so to speak, of the pogrom of Gujarat when we met at Gulbrook Society. Testa was there, Ashwander, Cedric Prakash, Shivish Vanatan. Uh, and it was such an important moment to stand and say, it happened. It happened, in spite of all the erosion, all the attempt at denying, diluting, forgetting, to commemorate is important to have it registered, to have it in the collective memory. So this is the 25th anniversary, there'll be a, a 30th anniversary, there have to be a 35th. It has to be constantly reminded, especially because as you said, those who were born after that would not know. And, well, it, it, if I can just make a comparison with France, we have just commemorated the 100 years of the First World War. And I came to learn that after we recuperated the eastern part of France that had been taken by the Germans in 1870, the French had expelled hundreds of thousands of people who were considered as German in that part. It was not in any of our textbooks. So you realize that you can erase facts, massive facts, if the state is not registering them in history. So if the state doesn't do it, citizens have to do it, and they have need to commemorate. And the second point I wanted to make has to do with uh, the civil society kind of resistance that can be opposed to um, communal forces at a time when not only you have vigilantes, but you have also policemen supporting the, the vigilantes or being complacent vis-a-vis -vis the vigilantes, or being killed by the vigilantes. Whatever the result, you can't rely on the police. So in these circumstances, you need civil society to get organized even more. Because who else can take care of minorities? But of course it cannot be a resistance that uses force, because this is self-defeating. It has to be, of course, non-violent, as you said, but it has to be massive, because a non-violent minority within the minority cannot make much of a difference. And in fact, this is the kind of preparation, networking, um, that uh, Mahatma Gandhi did, I mean, uh, if you remember that. Sorry, I will, I will really be particular with that. Um, so the, yes, these, these are the two points that I need to make. But the second one, of course, uh, with one deadline in view, we may well see events happening again in the coming month and in a different circumstances, in different circumstances, re requesting society to get prepared for this kind of confrontation uh, even more than before. Well, there is a kind of continuity between what you've said and the book you've made and what I'm going to tell you. Simply because 
the same way you try to get memories right, I try to get <coughs> facts right. And it has become a kind of obsession with me. Because the more disinformation you're confronted with, the more you are longing for data, you are longing for facts. At a time when, by the way, you don't find data, facts, in the public sphere. You know, when you look at the paucity of data that is affecting India today, every traditional sources yeah, of information. I will use that mic. Okay. Because you're okay. not audible at the back. Yeah. All right. Is it better? Yeah. Okay, yeah. sorry about that. Um, yeah, the NSS survey is postponed. Uh, the Labour Bureau is not uh, working properly. Statistics are changed every year. You have a different growth rate. You know, where are the statistics? Where are the data? They are vanishing. And you can't have a public debate, you can't really engage in a democratic manner if you don't know what the facts are, what is really happening. Because if you don't know what is happening, of course, demagogy, populism, and uh, any kind of deformation uh, is, is going to happen. So this is why with colleagues, students, including Mita, by the way, uh, we are compiling data. And it has become a kind of industry. I'm not at all a, da a, a, a data person. Uh, I don't like uh, so much uh, compiling uh, figures and so on. But I've forced myself, and with Ashoka University, uh, Trivedi Center for Political uh, data, we have compiled uh, massive databases. So what I'm going to share with you is a series of graphs, uh, tables, that I will comment, of course, but uh, I think it's very important to know where we stand. And what I'm going to show is first that Muslims have been traditionally very much underrepresented in almost each sphere of the state apparatus. And really it came as a surprise to me. I did not anticipate such a low representation of Muslims in so many spheres of the public uh, apparatus. That will be the first part of my presentation. We'll speak about the police, we'll speak about the IPS, we'll, uh, IAS, sorry, IPS, IPS, IAS. Uh, we'll speak about uh, uh, the judiciary if we have the time. That's the first section. Muslims have never been there, in fact. And I repeat, it was really a surprise for me. I thought it was better before. It was not. Where it was better before was in the elected assemblies. You used to have Muslim MLAs. You used to have Muslim MPs. You used to have Muslim ministers. And what we see now is a decline of this as well. And I keep the rest for the conclusion. So if we turn to the first table, and again I repeat, uh, uh, I will try to um, be quick, but, uh, and I hope you will see it properly from the back. What you have here is the proportion of Muslims among the IPS officers between 1951 and 2016. That took us a long time to compile. And by the way, to find the, the list of IPS officers is, is really something difficult. I, I was... Francis, I, could you uh, maybe zoom that? Because people at the back... Yeah, so let me give you the figures, because it's very simple. It's, it's sadly very simple. Muslims have never, or have only twice, represented more than 4% of the IPS officers of this country. And even less than that if you remove Jammu and Kashmir, because in Jammu and Kashmir you need to have IPS officers who are Muslim. If you remove Jammu and Kashmir, then you, have, you fall back on the red bars. And the red bars tell you that Muslims are all, have almost never represented more than 3% of the IPS officers. 3% of the IPS officers 
when of course the proportion of Muslims, this is the green line, has increased from 10% to 14.5% if you go by the 2011 census. So the gap between the percentage of Muslims in society and the percentage of Muslims among IPS officers is now something like 11 percentage points. It has never been so huge. There are hardly any IPS officers taking care of law and order in states like Uttar Pradesh, Rajasthan, Gujarat, and so on. But the change is very minimal. It has never been a good representation anyway. <coughs> if we turn next to the IES, then you have the impression, you are under the impression that there are huge variations. No, no, there are huge variations because the scale is very large. Among the IES officers, Muslims have always been very much underrepresented. Some years, you have zero Muslims included in the um, IES batches. This is only between 78 and 2016 uh, because it's very difficult to get old uh, lists, civil lists. Um, maximum in the 95 batch, you have 8% of the IES officers who are Muslims. And as I said, in many cases, there is a decline of taking them to zero. What does it mean? It means that there are very few Muslim DMs, district magistrates, of course, very few secretaries, uh, and general secretaries and so on. Uh, I'll, I'll skip the uh, judiciary story, but the judiciary story is very similar. Very few judges, very few uh, justices. Uh, sorry. Is this point zero eight? Uh, yeah. No. You you have to transform that eight into percent. eight percent. Sorry. I, yeah. Eight percent. <laughs> it peaked eight percent in ninety five. So this is really an exceptional batch. When in ninety five you have eight percent of the IS officers who are Muslims. As you can see, the average is much lower. Hmm? Much, much, much lower. No, I'm asking because the point zero eight, eight or point eight. No, it is it is eight eight percent in fact. You have to multiply by hundred. Huh? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Sorry. Because you have to multiply by hundred. So eight percent is the maximum, zero is the minimum, and you have many times zero, you have only once eight percent. Okay? And the gap again is increasing because you have only 10% of Muslims in 51, you have 14.5% of Muslims in 2011. Okay, so the gap is increasing. So, yeah, I was mentioning the judiciary just by passing, the situation is the same, very few Muslims, and less and less uh, in that case. What I want to focus upon now is the presence of Muslims in the elected assemblies. Lok Sabha and Vidhan Sabha. Lok Sabha is a very interesting uh, and disturbing trend. Shows a very disturbing trend. In 1980, with 49 MPs, Muslims represent 9% of the Lok Sabha. 9% at a time when Muslims are 11%. The gap is very small. Now this is a very interesting election. Indira Gandhi is back, Indira Gandhi is back with some Muslim support. And she gives tickets to many Muslim candidates. And if you look at the trend, from 9%, it declines to 8.4%, to 6%, to 5.1%. There is a slight increase afterwards when uh, especially when um, UPA1 uh, takes over in 2004, 6.4%, and then it declines again, 2009, 5.5%, and the last Lok Sabha election has sent a record number of Muslims in terms of <coughs> diminution, because we are below 4%. Of course, the by-election recently gave one MP <laughs> in UP to the Muslims, but UP is a tragic story because there was absolutely no other Muslim before. 
And for the first time in 2014, the ruling party can win the election without even one Muslim MP. Never in the history of India you had the winning party without any Muslim MP. And that forced the BGP government to uh, go to the Rajya Sabha for fighting Muslim ministers or minister of state. But again, very few of them, but uh, I will come to that later on, uh, because you had only two ministers, two Muslim ministers, and um, never before you had so few representatives of the minorities in the government of India. Uh, incidentally, one of them is a Shia, and unsurprisingly, you have this, we can return to that in the discussion if you want, you have a very disturbing alignment of some Shia leaders on the BGP, especially in Lucknow, which is a new development. Well, not so new in a way, but to that extent, yes, it's a new development. And uh, that's something we can return to in the discussion if you want, because this kind of sectarian divide is, of course, uh, undermining the capacity of resistance of the minority. What is interesting, sorry, let's re now <laughs> turn to this table. What is interesting, and, and, and you can't really follow all this data from such a long uh, distance, but what is interesting is to see who gives tickets to Muslim candidates. Well, some parties are, of course, ignoring the Muslims, and BGP is the first one to do that. Only 1.6% of their candidates were Muslim. So, of course, to have zero MP is not so, so surprising. Uh, so, who gives tickets to uh, Muslims? Uh, Congress doesn't. Congress is not giving tickets to Muslims in large numbers. Only 5.7% of the Congress candidates were Muslim. 5.7%. I will return to that. Congress is following... Well, we'll return to that. It's a very, very, very important point, and I, won't, I want to elaborate on that by looking at other data, reconfirming this trend. So who gives tickets? Of course, uh, RJD, I will not keep all the list, but just keep three or four names in mind. RJD, RJD in BR, 20.7% of uh, Muslims, um, of Muslim candidates. Samadvadi party, 18.4% of Muslim candidates. 18% is exactly the percentage of Muslims in UP. 18, 18 plus. So, they give the same percentage to Muslims among their candidates as Muslims are representing in society. Um, BSP, not that great. 9.6% only in 2014. Uh, Trinamul Congress, I'll return to that. Trinamul is indeed with 16% giving many tickets to the uh, Muslims, uh, Muslim candidates. If we turn to the Vidan Sabhas now, and uh, you will not be able to read this, so I will not uh, refer to that. What I will do is look to look at the graphs only. Here you have a very interesting evolution because in at the state level, the first scenario you see is the drastic diminution of Muslim MLAs when BGP takes over from a state party, hmm? first type. Now, 2017, BGP wins a landslide victory in UP. Look at the graph. The percentage of Muslim MLAs dropped from 18% or 17% to 6%. So today you have 6% of Muslim MLAs in Lucknow zero on the Congress, sorry, two on the BGP side. And again, in uh, Adityanath, uh, in Yogi Adityanath's government, you have 
two Muslim ministers, including one Shia. So that's the first type. Drastic diminution of Muslim representation when power shifts from a state party to a BGP government. The second type is represented by Maharashtra in the first place, but you will see it will be represented by many others. It makes hardly any difference when power shifts from Congress to BGP. The percentage of Muslim among MLAs is already very low when the ruling party is Congress. You look at Maharashtra, it makes hardly any difference. You know, in Maharashtra, the Muslims represent somewhat, well, 10% of society, and they have never represented more than 5% of the MLAs in the uh, 90s and 2000s. Be the Shiv Sena, or the Congress, or the BGP in office, it makes hardly any difference. This is also true of Gujarat. You know, in Gujarat, in 1990, the winner is Congress. The percentage of Muslim MLAs drops like anything. And BGP retains power since 1995. It makes hardly any difference. So, same, same story. Huge underrepresentation. In, in, in Gujarat, Muslims are slightly less numerous, 9%. And they have never represented in the 90s and 2000s more than 2.5% of the MLAs. You have a couple of Muslim MLAs in places where you can only have a Muslim MLA. Hmm? Ahmedabad, Baroda have seats which are Muslim dominated. So what else can you have? Be beyond, beyond that, nothing. This is also true of Karnataka. I need to update that, but really the next election made no difference. Uh, same story. 10% of Muslims, whoever is in office since uh, the 90s, never more than 5% of the MLAs are Muslim. Whoever is in office, GDS, Congress, BGP, makes no difference. And last but not least, Madhya Pradesh, where, uh, in fact, we've seen a decline, but a decline from 2% to half a percent. So it was already remarkably low, you know, 2%. 2% under Dick Jason, half a percent against uh, under uh, Sirat Chohan. By the way, I, will, I, I have just updated this data. This, this is uh, something we, we've done with the Ashoka University people um, last night. Uh, you see the Muslims at the, at the bottom, uh, the new government, I mean, the new assembly elected day before yesterday makes hardly any difference. Very, very few Muslims have been elected in spite of the coming back of the Congress. Orange, the orange line, yeah, yeah. You know, why is it important to keep this in mind? The percentage of Muslims in society is here. The percentage of Muslims in the assembly is there. This is the gap. That, that is the difference between representation in society and in the assembly. The state where it makes some difference when Congress is in office is Rajasthan. And that's the last uh, case. No, you see, the second type so far has suggested that it makes no difference when the Congress is in office or when the BGP is in office. Maharashtra, Gujarat, Karnataka, Madhya Pradesh represent this type. Rajasthan is interesting because every five years it change. And it makes some difference for the Muslims. When Congress is in office, when Ashok Gelot is chief minister, you see the peak above 6%. When BGP is in office, they drop to 1% only. And this is true also of what happened yesterday, or day before yesterday. Uh, slight uh, recovery, you see on this uh, graph, here are the Muslims. 
You see what, what we saw is true again. When BGP is there, it's very low. When con BG Congress is there, it's somewhat higher. But it's not such a big difference. So the conclusion you have to draw from this second type is, is Congress still representing Muslims in the assemblies? And we need to talk more about that. It's not because they don't give tickets to Muslims that they don't defend Muslims, but they can do more probably. And the third and last type is pre represented, by, by, represented by only one state, that is West Bengal. The only state in India where the percentage of Muslims is increasing in the assembly is West Bengal. Because of Trinamul Congress. But of course it's not, it's not proportional to the percentage of Muslims because Muslims are more than 30% and MLAs are roughly at 20%. What I want to quickly add is that it's not because Muslims don't want to be elected, don't want to be represented, that there are so few in assemblies. In fact, we will go through this series showing that the percentage of Muslim candidates, three, the number of Muslim candidates, has continuously increased till the late 90s when it became very expensive when you lost your deposit. Well, you lost a lot. So, less Muslim candidates present, offered themselves for election, but they started to increase again. Look at this graph. You know? All these hundreds of people in Gujarat are Muslim people who fought elections as independent because nobody gave them tickets. And it's not only in Gujarat. If you go through the, the list, Karnataka, same story, Maharashtra, many people. You, can, you, can you see these figures? It's amazing. You have, you have in Maharashtra, you have 400 Muslim candidates in 2014. 400 Muslim people try to be elected in the Vidhan Sabha election of 2014 as independent because nobody gave them tickets. Same in Madhya Pradesh. Yeah, next. Orissa also. Orissa, of course, few Muslims are there, but it works the same way. Rajasthan, same trend. UP, almost similar. And West Bengal, of course. So it's not that they don't want to be elected, it is just that they are not given tickets and therefore as independent, they fail. How can you be elected as an independent? No way. Why does it matter, and I'll end there, why does it matter to have MPs and MLAs? Because you can say, well, you don't need to be there, really. Some other people can take care of us. In fact, it doesn't work like that. If we were uh, in, 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 a, in a particular science class, uh, I would elaborate on theories of representation. You know, there are two theories of representation. One theory says you just let anybody represent your interest because the MP will take care of his constituency, not of its community. That's one theory. And the other theory says it's much better to have your people in the corridors of power because nobody else will take care of you. Hmm? There are two theories of representation. And the second one, I think, is much more relevant. In fact, we have just completed a very interesting research at Ashoka University again about who speaks up for the Muslims in the Lok Sabha. It's a very complicated issue. You have to look at all the aspects, riots, reservations, um, triple talak or whatever related to uh, personal law. You know, we have a list of what does it mean to speak for the Muslim. And we came with this conclusion that in fact, more than 23% 
of all the questions asked to the government about Muslims came from Muslim MPs, who represent only 3.7% of the MPs. So 3.7% of the MPs are responsible for more than one-fifth of the questions, showing that, yes, they speak more for their people, and it makes sense. So that's my conclusion. It matters a lot to have some people representing your interest in these assemblies, because if this group, if the greedy is not there, there will be less people to speak in defense of the minorities. And I'll stop here.